You are listening to another episode of No Fair Remembering Stuff, the Tuesday edition of the Professional F Podcast, and available wherever you get your podcasts, and at our website, prolevpod.com, where you can also contribute to this podcast. There is a Patreon button at our website, or you can mail us a letter and or contribution at The Professional F Podcast, P.O. Box 9133, Springfield, Illinois, 62791. And it's not safe for work. Today we're going to talk about a subject near and dear to our hearts. Yes. A scam that popped up in the wake of the collapse of the George W. Bush administration. Now, we're not going to talk about the GOP rebranding scam commonly referred to by uh, media elitists as the Tea Party. Uh, We will definitely be devoting a future episode to that mess, but today we're going to remember another equally sketchy rebranding scheme that ran almost exactly parallel to the fake Tea Party. But first, let's set the scene. In 2006, the Bush administration began to collapse. In November of that year, the Democrats would whip the Republicans in the midterms. And the smell of something broken and rotten coming from the heart of the GOP hung in the air all year. The news from Iraq was ominous and getting worse. It was the year that George W. Bush went from praising Donald Rumsfeld as the greatest Secretary of Defense in history. So great. Shortly before the midterm elections, to firing Rummy (laughs) one day after the election. Yep, whoops. This is from NBC News on November 8, 2006, Rumsfeld stepping down. Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld stepped down as Defense Secretary on Wednesday, one day after midterm elections in which opposition to the war in Iraq contributed to heavy Republican losses. Also, by 2006, the huge Clinton budget surplus that was in existence when George W. Bush took office. And I've got to say, was projected to go on forever. Yeah, we were never yeah. going to have deficits again. And and why not make bigger tax cuts, sure. said David Brooks. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that surplus was gone. Nothing but a dim and distant memory. Instead, Under unified Republican control of the government, the United States was now running a $248 billion a year budget deficit with no end in sight. Yeah. Thanks in large part to lying us into war and tax cuts for billionaires. Yeah. You know, tax cuts for billionaires. There's going to be a theme emerging over the course of this uh, (laughs) podcast (laughs) about deficits and tax cuts, but- For now, let's focus on 2006, which is also the year that Holy Joe Lieberman almost lost his job to Ned Lamont. Thanks to the net roots, that's us, yay us, uh, Ned Lamont beat the incumbent Lieberman in the Connecticut Democratic primary that year. This was unheard of. In fact, we did a series of podcasts on the OG blogosphere earlier this year, and we'll put a link in the, uh, the notes, but there's a whole bunch of talking we did about what was going on during this period that gave rise to the net roots and then the fall of the net roots. Um, remember, in 2000, Joe Lieberman had been the Democratic Party's candidate for vice president. Lieberman was a huge Iraq war supporter and George W. Bush's favorite Democrat. Bush even kissed him on the mouth after the 2005 State of the Union address. But by 2006, all of that goodwill and joy and 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 uh, the, the pats on the head he got from George Bush had become an anvil around Holy Joe's neck. And after Ned Lamont beat him fair and square in the primary, the Beltway media lost their collective minds. Lieberman started his own political party, ran as its sole candidate, and with the backing of Connecticut Republicans, he beat Ned Lamont in the general election in 2006. And as we briefly touched on in our other series last year about David Brooks that went on and on, and on. It did. There were like 28 <laughs> episodes. It was 28, 30 episodes. It was uh, our ultra, the, if you will. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the trauma of seeing an establishment hack, dear friend and fellow Iraq war cheerleader like Lieberman lose to a dirty hippie peacenik broke David Brooks's brain so badly that he pitched an hysterical 
op-ed fit in the New York Times calling for the creation of a party number three. This is from Brooks in August of 2006. There are two major parties on the ballot, but there are three major parties in America. There is the Democratic Party, the Republican Party, and the McCain-Lieberman Party. Mm -hmm. If you read Brooks's 2006 tirade about tribalism and polarization, you will hear a virtual Rosetta Stone for all future third-party, third-way scams from no labels to the forward party. They're all built on the sanctification of the imaginary, sane, sensible center. And in virtually all of Brooks's writing for the next 17 years, 17 years, 17 years, you can also see the rules and vocabularies, which will be found in every successful Beltway Pundit's style book. Yeah, they all talk this way forever. Then Mm -hmm. in 2008, the GOP base and the establishment confidently predicted that John McCain was going to beat that darn upstart Barack Obama from Illinois and Karl Rove's promise of a permanent Republican majority. Remember that? The permanent Mm -hmm. Republican majority. That would be much closer to a reality. After all, John McCain was a war hero, and the base loved Sarah Palin, so what could possibly go wrong? Then John McCain got shellacked by Obama, and suddenly millions of Republicans felt the urgent need to burn their Bush Cheney bumper stickers and run away from all the disasters they had created. The party of personal responsibility wanted nothing to do with taking personal responsibility for the previous eight-year shit show. And this is when our domestic acts of evil began to split apart. The Republican base, who are cowards, who couldn't bear the idea of being held responsible for all the horrible things they said and did during the Bush years, coped with their massive failure by putting on stupid hats and calling themselves the Tea Party and pretending they'd never heard of George Bush, George who, and the media went right along with it. But party elites and the elite pundits who helped create that base and had used that base to achieve political power had a completely different problem. They couldn't just slip away into the night unnoticed. They couldn't burn their uniform and pretend they'd been in Switzerland the whole time. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, those Lieberman-loving Lamont-hating party elites and pundits absolutely could not admit that the left had been right about the right all along. If for no other reason than objectively, this would mean that that not only had conservative pundits and the mainstream media been horribly wrong, they had actually been deeply complicit in selling the Bush administration's lethal lies to the public. It would also mean that GOP voters would be brought face-to-face with the humiliating reality that they had been chumps, that everyone they had trusted had lied to them over and over and over again, and that the worst people in the world, that's me and you, Blue Gal, the dirty hippies, (laughs) were the only ones who had not been fooled by this big, lying Republican bullshit. This was something that the wealthy individuals and institutes and projects and think tanks that underwrite the mainstream media simply could not allow. And this is when two things happened. First, to save themselves, the elite punditocracy needed a different strategy. So this was the moment when both sides do it, was fully codified as the official Beltway media state religion. And the myth of the sensible, centrist, independent voter became that religion's official dogma. Secondly, this is when the Republican base learned the most important conservative lesson of all. If you just lie hard enough and willfully forget hard enough, you can get away with anything. Mm -hmm. This mindset led directly to Trump. To create the myth of the sensible centrist independent voter, the media began by pretending that all the embarrassing power centers that were now the actual infrastructure of the GOP, that would be Fox News, Rush Limbaugh, all of his imitators on thousands of radio stations coast to coast, all of those Gingrich clones that were being elected to the House, all the Koch-funded think tanks and foundations, Breitbart and his imitators, on and on. All of those were merely the fringe. Yeah, they're, they're just, you know, that's the fringe. Hold Everybody on. Everybody who I'm... listens to Rush Limbaugh and, and does Ditto Head, they're just the fringe. You shouldn't even bother paying attention to those kooks. Step two, 
was to conjure up some liberal somewhere, imaginary or not, and denounce the extremes on both sides as the root of all political evils. Then, finally, they invented a sacred center out of whole cloth. This is where all reasonable and normal Americans were to be found, and which just so happened to look exactly like David Brooks's Republican policy bucket list <laughs> as filtered through Paul Ryan's magic arithmetic. Sweeping budget cuts, grand bargains. Remember Grand Bargain? Oh, I, I remember the Cat Food Council. Remember the Cat Food oh, Committee? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yep. And, you know, quit harping on race. Yeah, we're over that. What we really need is market-based solutions, Drift Glass. Yes, lots yada, of market-based solutions. Yeah, it, it, that, was, that was it. That was the world we were soaking in. And this lie had everything anyone could ever want. It was great. Republicans who had enabled the Bush administrations no longer needed a fear of being held responsible for anything they'd said or done because they had been born again as independents. And independents, I'm an independent. I'm an independent. That's, that's what my wife started doing that. It's now an, uh, a, a trend that's sweeping the nation. Uh, the mainstream media could crank out endless pious columns asking for civility and comity and why can't we all meet in the sensible center all while advancing the Republican agenda. And those of us who'd been right about the right all along, you know, us folks, the left, the people who'd been telling you this all along, we were now just one of the extremes on both sides. We, uh, we were out there still making noise, but nobody wanted to listen to some crackpot liberal yap about what happened in the before time because the before time is full of scary stuff. Uh, then the economy collapsed. And as the world plunged into the Great Recession, Democrats nominated and elected the first black president in American history. So things were about to get very weird. Because no matter how rational and calm and accommodating Barack Obama was, and no matter how racist and openly deranged the Republican reaction to Obama got, and we're not just talking about the birth certificate. No, the just, oh, it was, if you weren't there or if you were ignoring it, it was horrifying. It was yeah. horrifying. The the yep. the protests with Obama with a bone through his nose, the insult, yep. you know, the the lion mooch, African, the yeah, mooch oh. hell Obama, you know, welfare yeah. queen. It just it, and this was National Review was running this shit. The Tea right. Party rallies were this shit. It was everywhere, and the mainstream media just piously ignored it and said, "We can't really tell if this Those race is you, know, you know, that's, that's really the fringe. fringe. Yeah, mm -hmm. didn't matter." So uh, during all of that garbage, the elite media hung on to their big lie of both sides do it like grim death. Wealthy Upper West Side shut-ins and top-tier college presidents and CEOs and Aspen Institute types were all desperate to believe that somehow, it wasn't just the GOP, that somehow the Democrats were just as bad, or maybe worse, and that the will of some imaginary centrist majority was being held hostage by the extremes on both sides. You know, the left is very shrill, Drift Lab. We're shrill. I don't I know was if you told, knew that. I was told that I was too, uh, what was strident? Strident. Yeah, I was too strident to be on, on television. And now <laughs> I just, I flip over MSNBC any given day, and I see the entire Bulwark cast doing my shtick from 2006. Reading your blog, basically, but on Almost the verbatim. <laughs> uh, literally, yeah. Well, every liberal blog. They've synthesized all liberal blogs, and now that's their thing, except it only yeah. all began in 2015, which is what makes and it so And they quote period. each other. Oh, yeah. And they, it's, they as, to it's, not, it's not me, Charlie Sykes. It's Mona Sharon who said this. Let me and quote as, her reading Drift Glass, actually. <laughs> as my colleague Will Salatan uh, wrote about in my newsletter talking about Mona Sharon, it's a closed ecosystem. And <laughs> once again, liberals are not welcome anywhere near it. So yeah. anyway. Yeah. And, and on December 13th, 2010, from this very prolific manure pile of wealthy, credulous, desperate chumps, sprang an outfit called No Labels. Da, 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 da. No Labels was co-founded by Nancy Jacobson, the wife of the odious Mark Penn. We compiled most of this from various Wikipedia articles. Billionaires Michael Bloomberg and Andrew Tisch were among initial prominent supporters. In addition to Tisch and Bloomberg, early donors also included Ron Sage, founder of Panera Bread, and Dave Morin, a former Facebook executive. However, as a registered 501c4 organization, no labels is not required to disclose the identities of its donors and is famously opaque about where it gets its money. 
According to the Daily Beast, by the end of the 2018 cycle, no-label super PACs received more than $11 million from 53 donors, most of whom came from the financial industry. Shocking. Shocking, yes. A Chicago Sun-Times investigation reported that super PACs related to no-label... Pop, pop, pop. I can feel it too, honey. Start over. A Chicago Sun-Times investigation reported that super PACs related to no-labels include United for Progress Incorporated, Citizens for a Strong America Incorporated, United Together, Govern or Go Home, and Forward Not Back, which sounds really familiar. Uh, Open Secrets reported that Rupert Murdoch, ever heard of him? donated half a million dollars to United Together, one of the super PACs associated with No Labels. And just a few weeks ago, the New Republic reported that No Labels had received major funding, along with two dozen other new donors, from Clarence Thomas's very own sugar daddy, Harlan Crow. Nancy Jacobson has also been accused of asking No Labels staff to obscure where they work on LinkedIn in order to make it harder for journalists to figure out who is working for no labels. All employees are also required to sign an NDA. The identity of the members of no labels governing board is not listed on the organization's website, but can be tracked down through IRS filings. Yeah, it's like Vorgon, you know, construction plans. They're available, (laughs) but you can't get there from here. And one thing we do know is they hired uh, Mark Halperin to do like some accounting for them. It's, It's such a shady, sketchy, awful, shitty group. And that's who they are. This is who they are. Now we're going to take a very quick look at how they stayed alive all these years. Uh, First, it was rolled out with all the requisite beltway trumpets and flourishes. This is from Frank Rich in the New York Times, December 19th, 2010. Quote, although no label sounds like a progressive high school's model UN, its heavy hitters are serious adults or at least white male adults. Among the 16 billed speakers at last week's official launch in New York, there were three women and no blacks, notwithstanding an excruciating no labels anthem contributed by the Senegalese American rapper Akon. Please do not look at this on YouTube. It will hurt your mind. (laughs) The marquee names on hand include Michael Bloomberg, Senate Democrats, Kirsten Gillibrand of New York, and the incoming Joe Manchin of West Virginia. Moderate Republicans drummed out of office by the Tea Party, that would be Charlie Crist and Mike Castle, and no fewer than four MSNBC talking heads. Despite Bloomberg's denials, some persist in speculating that No Labels is a stalking horse for a quixotic 2012 presidential run. At the very least, the organization is a promotional hobby horse for MSNBC, which is still not our friend. Morning, Joe! plugged no labels with an alacrity to match Fox News's Tea Party boosterism, if not Fox's decibel level. Its two prime movers are a political consultant, Mark McKinnon, a veteran of the Bush and McCain campaigns known for slick salesmanship, and a fundraiser, Nancy Jacobson, who, along with her husband, the pollster and corporate flack Mark Penn, helped brand the Hillary Clinton presidential campaign as a depository for special interest contributions. No less depressing is the no labels veneration of Evan Bayh, the Democratic senator from Indiana who decided to retire this year rather than fight for another term. For months now, Bayh has been positioning himself as a sacrificial lamb to broken Washington. When he made the rounds plugging no labels last week, he was greeted as a martyr on MSNBC, unquote. And I'm sure at least one or two of you remember the noble work No Labels did towards the tail end of 2015 when they gave Donald Trump, yes, that Donald Trump, their coveted Problem Solver Award. Wow. I believe the speech... And even though by every... hmm? I believe the speech was presented by Joe Lieberman. I'm not sure about that. I have to look that up. Man. Yep. And even though by every conceivable measure, No Labels accomplished absolutely nothing but the fluffing of the egos of... Beltway both siders tax and redirecting large quantities of dark money from the checkbooks of credulous dopes into the pockets of no labels grifters. In the wake of the catastrophic 2016 election, David Brooks remained 100% certain that no label snake oil was still the perfect cure for what ailed American democracy. This is from PR News. One month after Donald Trump won the presidency. 
quote, the center strikes back. David Brooks, New York Times column heralds emergence of no labels led new center. God, God. In the wake of a historically divisive election, Uh No Labels is making an aggressive play to unify citizens and leaders around a new center, a development described in this morning's David Brooks New York Times column. Brooks draws on a recent memo written by Brookings scholar and No Labels co-founder Bill Galston and Weekly Standard editor Bill Crystal, who defined the new center as one that does not split the difference between the left and right, but offers a principled alternative to both. Its core tenets, opportunity, security, accountability, ingenuity, and stock market returns. No, that's not in there. (laughs) Yeah. Can respond to the challenges of the present and chart a path to the future. We do not know what policies a new center will yield. Yes, we do. Banking deregulation. Oh, wait, that's not in there either. Nor can we predict what institutional form or even party alignment it will take. But the alternative to a coherent and effective new center is a degree of public discontent that could end by undermining democratic self-government itself, unquote. Oh, no, we need this new center or democracy is in danger. What are we Uh going to do, danger girl? Uh, (laughs) One little side note that uh, Brookings scholar and No Labels co-founder Bill Galston currently can be found at the Bulwark. (laughs) He's uh, one of Mona Charon's Waxworks token liberals who agrees with 95% of everything she says and, and complains bitterly about liberals before grudgingly saying, well, maybe Joe Biden's slightly better. But it, he's one of those people. So, of course, he's for this. So that was how No Labels was conceived. And those are some of the forces that have kept them alive and grifting for the past 13 years. But No Labels, if you've been paying attention, has been back in the news in the past few months. So let's see what they have to say for themselves and what others have to say about them. And keep in mind, when they mention a thing called the Problem Solvers Caucus, That's No Label's own ineffectual political caucus inside the House of Representatives. This is from No Label's on April 20th of this year. And it's absolutely my favorite quote. Frank Luntz is absolutely right. Yeah. My mouth hurts saying that. In today's political climate, it's more important than ever to have the Problem Solvers Caucus. We need to find common ground and compromise on critical issues that are impacting our country. Impacting is not a word. Such as the debt ceiling, of course. From No Labels on April 28th, we will either have a bipartisan deal or we will default. Both sides are posturing for political advantage. It needs to stop. Sign our petition to tell President Biden and Speaker McCarthy it's time for a deal. From No Labels, April 21st, we didn't let party extremes stop us from helping to build up the Problem Solvers Caucus and giving them a nationwide support system to fix big things for the American people, like the debt ceiling. And the big news from Fox News, May 12th, 2023. Quote, No Labels taking next steps in search for presidential candidates for the third party ticket. Uh Uh-huh. Also from Fox News, quote, Joe Lieberman highlighted that No Labels has already raised roughly $30 million as part of its effort to get on the ballot in all 50 states, unquote. Yeah, and that's what kicked everything off. And that's what inspired us to do No no Labels, uh, No Fair Remembering stuff. Because for 13 years, No Labels has been allowed to grow and mutate and prosper because the elite media has been willing to defend the big lie that sustains no labels, the big lie of both sides do it. And things have gotten so far out of hand that no labels now has the money and the clout to make a credible third party bid, not in all 50 states, not enough to win anything, but enough to siphon off just enough votes to put Trump back in the White House. And you know what? They're not real fussy about how they do it. This is from the Portland Press Herald of May 11th, quote, Group trying to gain official party status warned against misleading voters. Maine's Secretary of State has sent a cease and desist letter to national organization No Labels, expressing concern that it has confused voters 
who think they're signing a petition, but instead are enrolling in a new party. They're tricking them into joining. Quote, over the past few months, municipal clerks have received reports from numerous Maine voters who did not realize that they had been enrolled in the No Labels Party, Bellows wrote, unquote. So now that things have gotten real, here's a representative sample of reactions from around the Internet. From pollster Rachel Bittekoffer, quote, You can really tell that No Labels is just a front group for old Republicans who just can't quite put country over party. Unquote. And this is from Reed Galen, co-founder of the Lincoln Project, Joe Cunningham, South Carolina one-term former House member, and now No Labels Flack, says the best way to keep a Democrat in the White House is for Joe Biden to lose next year. And then there's this hilarious triple play. The Lincoln Project, citing former Republican Congressman David Jolly, who was appearing on MSNBC. Quote, no doubt about it, a third-party 2024 candidate only helps Trump take back the White House. David Jolly explains why no labels elects Trump on MSNBC. Now, what makes this especially rich is that just a few years ago, David Jolly was out there trying and failing to start his own version of the no label scam. Jolly called his thing the Serve America movement. And when last I checked, which is just a couple of years ago, 93% of the Serve America movement's funding had come from one former big tobacco executive named Charles Wall. And his movement had a grand total of 649 registered members in New York, which is the only place on earth where it appeared on any ballot at all. So since his entire movement was being bankrolled by one guy, and since the world was not exactly beating a path to his door, you might be wondering why Mr. Jolly had any platform whatsoever. Well. It turns out, when I wrote about this way back two years ago, David Jolly's sales pitch for his movement fit hand in glove with the Bulwark's business model. Oh! A willingness, yeah, shocking, eh? For, first of all, he's a former Republican who's now just shocked the Republican Party who's full of Republicans. Blew him away when he found that out. Uh, there's the willingness to pretend that all the problems with the GOP began in 2015 or 2016 a willingness to play that old both sides do it pipe organ as hard as you need to, and a firm belief that America's great, centrist, moderate, imaginary majority has been shut out of the political process by the extremes on both yada, 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 yada. And he so, only found one tobacco executive to back him. I'll bet the bulwark has found lots of more oh, tobacco I, I, executives. <laughs> I, there are lots of people. They have all, their tendrils extend everywhere. But at this point, they're basically a subsidiary of MSNBC. Yeah. You cannot yeah. watch MSNBC for more than an hour without seeing at least one or two Bulwark employees. It's a straight up quid pro quo. Mm -hmm. And I really do wish they'd stop pretending they had anything to do because half the time on the Bulwark, they're insulting MSNBC or saying, I was on a cable news show today and blah, 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 blah. And I just, oh my God. like, yeah, because. They feel they need you, you need them, but without that kind of publicity, without that kind of constant coverage, the bulwark could drive and blow away. So right. back to David Jolly, who looked over a political marketplace already overstuffed with boutique, former Republican, third way, problem solving, beyond partisanship scams, and decided that this was the perfect foundation on which to build his own boutique, former Republican, third way, problem solving <laughs> beyond partisanship grift, which would consist of nothing but the Beltway common wisdom recycled from five years previous. And I wrote a long thing about it, and we'll put that in the podcast notes as well. From Stuart Stevens, author of It Was All a Lie, quote, it's absurd anyone could argue a third-party candidate, not a David Duke clone, could do anything but help elect Trump. It's like arguing what food to leave for Santa's reindeer to make sure he drops by childish but dangerous why is no labels doing this unquote and this is from lincoln project's own rick wilson mark penn the lead strategist for no labels writes a puff piece of helpful advice for ron DeSantis. so fickle just a few weeks ago penn was praising donald trump also from rick wilson april 17 this is your reminder that no labels is america's leading pro-trump super PAC. from charlie sykes april 18th no labels would serve as a spoiler benefiting the Republican ticket. 
So they all agree with you from three years ago, Drift Glass? Is that yes. it? Yes. Yes, they do. All agree with me from three years ago, maybe even longer ago than that. Uh, so where are we? Well, after 13 years of ignoring the grave and growing threat from no labels, and after decades of helping to spread the toxic both sides do it lie, that is the engine that powers no labels, suddenly all these people are worried that no labels is about to do to what exactly? What is it? What are they worried about? And now I'm going to risk pissing off a lot of people by out of context quoting from one of the greatest speeches in the English language. This is from Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream speech of August 28th, 1963. Quote, in a sense, we have come to our nation's capital to cash a check. When the architects of our great republic wrote the magnificent words of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, they were signing a promissory note to which every American was to fall heir. This note was a promise that all men, yes, black men as well as white men, would be guaranteed to the inalienable right of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, unquote. Yeah, and so that uncashed check motif is very uh, germane here uh-huh. in terms of no labels. Because for decades now, Beltway media elites and some of the biggest names in conservative media have been making a very good living issuing their own promissory notes over and over again, drumming into the heads of the public year after year the lie that America's problems are equally the fault of both sides. And therefore, America's only hope is a powerful breakthrough third party that represents the interests of the imaginary, sensible center and can break the stasis imposed by the extremes on both sides, Drift Glass. I hate those extremes. But here's the thing, because once the both sides do it lie became the Beltway media dogma, all of what followed became inevitable. And the only thing all of the no labels grifters are doing is showing up to cash that promissory note that Mike Bloomberg and David Brooks and Charlie Sykes and Joe Scarborough and Matthew Dowd and hundreds of others were only too happy to sign back when they thought no one would actually cash it. Mm -hmm. So now, you know, Joe Lieberman and his $30 million, no labels, is actually doing what they promised all along. They are going to represent the poor, imaginary, sensible, centrist, independent against the extremes on both sides by running a presidential candidate. Mm -hmm. So why are these never Trump a-holes complaining about that? (laughs) I know. They told you what they were going to do for 13 years. They finally scraped together enough money to do the thing that you praise them for doing based on the lie that you created. And now you're all mad and worried and freaked out. I'm freaked out, but I know what I'm talking about. Because to wrap this all up, we're going to actually move back through the timeline of events before everyone got all spun up about no labels actually bankrolling a third party, before MSNBC created the bulwark out of thin air before Charlie Sykes and Rick Wilson and all the rest of them got run out of the GOP, and even before Donald Trump. We're going to go back 13 years to December 15th, 2010, just two days after No Labels was launched, when I wrote this post entitled, Dead Center, Political Cowardice Now Has Its Own Movement. Ahem! In case you had ever idled away an afternoon screwing around with your old political chemistry set, fantasy football league lineups, and wondering what would happen if you took a bunch of Republican primary losers, Charlie Crist, added a goon bag of out of work and out of favor former Republican speechwriters and campaign button men, David Frum, John Avalon, Mark McKinnon, the last politically arteriosclerotic insider DLC goofs who aren't already drawing paychecks under the Obama administration's former Clinton White House full employment project, that'd be Nancy Jacobson, a.k.a. Mr. Mrs. Mark Penn, Republican minor TV celebrities, Joey Jojo Jr., Joe Scarborough, and David fucking Brooks, and then sprinkle the resulting crime against nature with an assload of money because there are always, always endless assloads of money available for any horrible idea that reinforces the villager's sensibilities. What you get crawling out of the Petri dish are things like the auto-tuned, content-free, sugar coma horror that is the No Labels Anthem. But nothing we didn't expect, right? I mean, ever since the Republican base ducked out on paying the tab for a generation of being loudly and catastrophically wrong about everything by putting on funny hats, screaming about liberty, 
and calling themselves the Tea Party, their sleazy centrist enablers have been seething with jealousy. Quite suddenly, the monster they built didn't need them anymore. And the skeevy hustlers who'd helped create the racist, corporatist, dominionist confederacy on the bones of the New Deal and the grave of the American dream found themselves cast out and looking for their next meal ticket. Preferably a meal ticket under the banner like the Tea Party that wouldn't keep bringing up their horribly inconvenient past as sleazy enabling hustlers. Hey kids, I have an idea. Let's peel those icky damn labels off of everything and presto, there's magically no longer any difference between rat poison and applesauce. Can I have my million dollars now? Well, how about another better idea? One for which there is never a million dollar payday for Beltway Insiders because it does not offer to chop shop your miserably failed past out of existence and let you roll right back out the door cleansed and shriven thanks to a cheap tea party or no label spray job. How about to fix our big national problems, we start calling our problems by their real names so that we can deal with them as they really are. Of course, the problem is if you take your political nutrients by rebreathing Rush Limbaugh's beer farts, racist beer farts, you can't join. If your worldview is informed by mainlining Glenn Beck conspiracy theories with ever larger gauge needles, you can't join. If you believe the Earth is 9,000 years old, that global climate change is a George Soros put-up job, that science is bad, and insist that your heads-up-your-ass fantasies be legislative into reality, you can't join. If you are Newt Gingrich or his space-age polymer wife, you can't join. If you're Sarah Palin, you really, really, really can't join. If you want the government to keep its hands off your Medicare, you can't join. If you're a birther or a death panel monger, you don't even fucking bother. You can't join. If you lied us into a war and then botched that war, you can't join. If you listen to Fox News and hate radio to get both sides, you can't join. If your bookshelf is shot through with crap that's been pooped out of Regnery Press Mendacity Factory for 20 years, you can't join. If you think President Obama and anyone slightly to the left of Sean Hannity is a radical, committed Marxist. You can't join. If you still think Acorn is a threat, Andrew Breitbart is a journalist, and James O'Keefe is a hero, you can't join. So, tallying up the results, looks like the entire conservative movement is wingnut non grata to the No Liars movement. How very sad. (laughs) Worse yet, if you are a purveyor of the biggest lie of all, you are obviously out of the club as well. And what is the biggest lie of all? Remember, this is me writing 13 years ago, that both sides do it. And then, because I'm a blogger, I cite my own blog from 2007, from even before 2013, during the Bush administration. And that post, which I appended to this post, was called The Big Lie. And here it goes. The big lie. And for 20 years, while the mass purveyors of carefully calibrated hate and rage and xenophobia on the right gathered more and more power, got more and more vulgar and vicious in their rhetoric, what did the left try to do? We tried to find common ground, to meet our opponents halfway, to compromise with people who sneered at the very idea of working together and said quite openly that compromise was, quote, political date rape, unquote. While the emperor of weaponized bile, Newt Gingrich, took over the House with a campaign explicitly based on calling Democrats traitors at every opportunity, and Limbaugh was being honored as the majority maker by those House Republicans, we on the left were still trying to do and be all the nicey-nice things that Alan Simpson is now all weepy and wistful for. And it didn't work. And while we played by the Marquis of Queensbury rules, the orcs laughed in our faces, overran the joint, and bequeathed us, as its apotheosis, the worst, most despicable, most incompetent, most constitutional-loathing administration in American history. That would be the Bush administration. Al Franken and Air America did not arise in a vacuum. They came into being as a desperate 11th-hour attempt to fight back against a 20-year multimedia blitz of unremitting, unrebutted conservative lies and bigotry. They arose because no one in the mainstream media had the guts to take on the GOP propaganda machine head on. Instead, the mainstream media collaborated because collaborating in the big lie was a much better, safer career move. Progressive radio arose because politicians like Alan Simpson were for 20 years 
perfectly content with looking the other way and harvesting the electoral fruits of the poison tree that their conservative, Christopath, racist, hate radio, hate TV, hate satellite, hate cable, and hate publishing so lavishly watered and fertilized because the GOP was never concerned with the destruction of political comedy as long as it was working to their advantage. As long as all of the screeching Orwellian hellfire was coming from the right, they never said a fucking word. But now, finally, after 20 years of unilateral disarmament, now the left has at last decided to fight back hard, suddenly, old Republican loons like Simpson get all gooey for the glory days of cellulose collars and nickel candy bars and whalebone corsets and heroic cavalry charges and a politics of gentle, ruffled fisticuffs followed by brandy, cigars, and top-shelf hookers. Suddenly, it's the zealots on both sides that have torn his beloved temple down. Well, fuck you, Alan Simpson. Fuck you sideways for your bogus hand-wringing and crocodile tears. And fuck you, George Mitchell, for sitting there with your big thumb up your ass and allowing your good Republican friend to spread this big lie unchallenged right under your nose. And then I jumped back to 2013. Or 2010, rather. So, more sad, looks like our centrist friends are out of the club, too. Leaving one group which, whatever their faults and frailties, by and large doesn't fucking lie to you all day every day in order to scare you so stupid that you'll not only gladly drink poison, but you'll demand a second helping if the first dose doesn't kill you. And that would be us. That would be us. I need a cigarette and I don't smoke. Well, I used to write longer posts back in the day, Blue Gal. But (laughs) one of the virtues of having an archive, of doing this for 18 years. Oh, isn't it great to have an archive? Sure is. When people barking and yipping about, you know, the no, there's no labels bunch. Like, dude, we told you 13 years ago, this is a Republican scam. This is where they're headed. This is what they want to do. This is clearly what this is about. It is in support of a big lie that you will not call a lie because your career depends on it. Now, once again, another big lie told by Republicans, backed by the centrists and the mainstream media has caught up with them and they don't know what to do. So. What do you and I do, Blue Gal, when these things happen? Uh, we keep fighting. <laughs> and, I, and I think we celebrate the fact that there are now a number of House members elected in 2018 who have learned some of these lessons and learned oh. that you do have to punch back right yes. in the groin. Yes, you do. Uh, and, and seeing those Democrats on these Republican oversight committees really coming for them yeah. and, and noting you guys have nothing. Uh, and and pushing back really hard, uh, I think is uh, it makes me feel good to know that. Let's well, get and, more like that, please. And this is why the whole concept of it all started in 2015. Please do not ask any questions about anything that happened before 2015 is so offensive and so wrong. And I, and I personally can't let it go because it right. actually matters. It actually matters how Republicans got to be this way. And if you're one of the people of the many, many people in the media who just draws a line, builds a wall, says we're not going past 2015, we're locking it down, we're only going to talk about Trump and going forward, then you're the problem. And you're the problem just the same way you were 10 years before that and 10 years before that. if, If there's a subject that is of direct and critical importance to understanding a problem, if you go to your doctor and you get a diagnosis and he won't tell you what it is or what caused or how to fix it, then you go get another doctor because you know something's wrong. Something's critically wrong. But the people who are trying desperately to protect the past from scrutiny, I see no difference between this and like the 1619 project in, in sort of small font. Right, right. It's like right. we did all kinds of heinous shit that we do not want to be held accountable for or even talk about. So we're going to use the commanding heights of the media that we now control because you idiots let us colonize the media. We're going to declare the past off limits, and we're just going to talk about 2015 and going forward, which mm-hmm. gives us the freedom to, A, rip off the entire liberal critique of the Republican Party without, with, while pretending liberals don't exist, and B, still shit on the Democratic Party and pretend that both sides are kind of pretty bad, but we're stuck with the Democrats for the time being. And if, if, that is, if they're allowed to get away with that, and I'm, I'm sure they will, we're going to go through this all over again. That, that brings the George W. Bush, Donald Trump administration back again. 
Because that's does. the purpose. As as much as a third way presidential candidate ushers Donald Trump into the White House, mm-hmm. maintaining that both sides do it bullshit allows, oh, we have to take turns being in control of this country. Right. No, we don't. No, no, we really don't. The, and antecedent to all the Republican lies and all the centrist bullshit is the both sides do it lie. That That is the place where things began. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time. See you next time. The Professional F Podcast No Fair Remembering Stuff Tuesday edition is produced under a Creative Commons license. Copyright 2022-23, DGBG Productions. DGBG Productions.